um, because she's moved out now. Okay. But I, like, well, I, let's turn this over to Daniel and to Frank. Daniel? Well, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a borderline disorder, that's very specific type of work. And hopefully she's dealing with somebody, a psychiatrist or a psychologist or, or a medical doctor locally that can really diagnose what's going on. The addiction, if it's really an addiction with, with the weed, sounds like it's more of a coping mechanism right now than a, than a pure outright addiction that's controlling her life. So I, I'd really recommend that you really get some, some local help um, at a high level with a psychiatrist or a psychologist or, or starting at your family doctor in terms of the borderline disorder. Because that's really, it sounds like that, that's the starting point of, of where she will need help immediately. Mm. Frank, go ahead. Yeah. From my understanding, um, your concern is whether it can be developed into something worse or um, from my understanding that I don't know anything that um, borderline personality disorder can develop into becoming worse and um, I also know that there's a lot of times that uh, BDS gets mixed up with bipolar mm -hmm. so depending on who assessed her and how it was done maybe she needs to get reassessed and perhaps some um, medication or whatever it takes may help her get back on track but you do need to see a professional for that um, a professional psychologist or psychiatrist yeah. thank you very much gentlemen and Linda thank you to you we're gonna take another break here on living clean living well but when we come back more of your phone calls I've been through multiple treatment centers uh, with my addiction, fighting it for the last 10 years, 17 detoxes, three different treatment centers. But uh, they put me into counseling and everything here after my detox, which is the smartest thing I could have ever done. I got the real demons out of me that I wasn't able to do over the last 10 years with all those other detoxes, all those other treatment centers, from private ones to government ones. And this place has actually given me my life back. Hello. I'm Ellen Campbell, the CEO and founder of the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness. As a charity, we depend on viewers such as yourself to support the programs for First Nations, women and children, anti-bullying and elder abuse. I invite you to visit our website, see what you can do to share. Any donation over $20 will receive a tax receipt. Thank you so much for all your support. Welcome back. You're watching Living Clean, Living Well, live here on CTS Television. Tonight we're talking to Daniel Kahn and Frank Mazawi from Freedom From Addiction. They are our guests tonight. Um, a great resource for you out there is um, Recovery Wire magazine. And their latest issue is out, a free magazine. All you have to do is go onto their website, Recovery Wire Magazine, and uh, just request a free copy. Um, great information in there, fantastic articles, and a good friend to this show, as are the great folks at Freedom From Addiction. So we've got lots of resources for you. Let's go back to our phone lines, and Shelley's calling in tonight from London. Shelley's on line three. Hi there, Shelley. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Have you got a question or a comment? I actually have a question, yes. Sure, go ahead. I have a daughter who's 23 who was addicted to fentanyl, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she went to a rehab center for 45 days, and the day she came out, I'm sure she started using again, mm -hmm. and that was about four months ago, and I just don't know what to do to help her now. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, the, the, it's unfortunate that that type of situation happens way too often where somebody has made a commitment, they've gone into a treatment center, they've done the work, at least they've tried to do the work, and as soon as they come out, something's changed, they're not comfortable, they gotta go back to what, mm -hmm. the only thing that they really know. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular case, it sounds like you're, you're more than aware of what's going on. Um, I would suggest if, if there's an opportunity to get back into a treatment center, a different treatment center, and typically, the first few weeks in a treatment center, or you're either detoxing or you're just starting to get comfortable with the environment. Yeah. And so 45 days sounds like a lot, but it took a lifetime to get to where a person's at. So 45 days in this case sounds like it's just not enough time and more of a 60 or a 90 day program. And again, going back to what I said earlier, what happens after the fact? Is there a plan in place for what happens when this person is leaving and getting back into their environment where they're used to doing drugs? So I'd be suggesting 
hopefully she can get into a longer term program and really creating a solid plan going into the into the treatment center during the treatment center and then after the treatment center mm -hmm. Shelley have you talked to her I spoke with her today about going into a treatment center for a year mm -hmm. and she said she'll never go back to another rehab facility oh my. she doesn't seem to think she's got a problem yeah uh, that's a typical thing that we hear uh, nothing's it? wrong yeah. yeah Frank the scary part is the fentanyl yeah. and um, a lot of people in the past that I have known have uh, passed away from fentanyl and it's a real dangerous, dangerous um, substance out there. And a lot of kids out there are just thinking it's a joke when it really isn't. Um, the patches, they don't know how much is being used and uh, what part, what portion of it is being, is being used and how much is being smoked or whatever they're doing it by. But they're being, um, a lot of people are dying from it. and. Um, it's up to you, I guess. It's not really up to you, it's up to her, but I know you just said she doesn't want to go back to another treatment center, um, but there's a, gotta be a way, you gotta get her into getting some sort of help, whether it's um, forced or I don't know. You have to get, get her off the fentanyl. It's really, really imperative. It's so dangerous, it's so scary. Um, I wish that you can somehow convince her, maybe do another, intervention or some something like that with some friends um, that's all I could really say it's just a dangerous drug so if if do you get people that call into freedom from addiction and they say you know Shelly's asking her question or there are other people there that could also help Shelly like when they call in uh, have, absolutely yeah there's we, so the big counselors there that yeah. could we, call we'll have a nurse on on staff we'll have counselors around there's mm -hmm. always availability to, to talk to somebody mm -hmm. um, in this case it sounds like it's gonna be a little difficult to get this person to call yeah um, so it's gonna come back to Shelly really having a, a, a hardcore full court press and really getting this person some help because as Frank was saying this this drug right now in the streets is is killing people faster mm -hmm. than many other drugs so that's not to scare you, but to give you an idea of how quickly you need to move on this, and hopefully there's something that you can do to convince her that she needs some help. The hardest part for any opiate addict is um, it's more physical too, because there's two points with, uh, with opiate addiction. You're either sick or you're high, and in between, there's nothing going on. There's, it's always fearing the withdrawals. And so when you tell somebody who's on opiates that they're going to be uh, going into treatment, right away withdrawal pains stick to their heads. But over at Freedom, we have like, uh, we have like the nurses and it's almost painless uh, withdrawal system that we do with a lot of clients. We've had clients come off of methadone and it was painless. So that's my suggestion is you got to get her off of it somehow even through detox and then she'll have a clear mind that you could talk to her and talk some sense. So the point is here that there are ways to make this painless. Yes. And maybe that could be communicated to Shelly's daughter. Yes, yes. absolutely. Shelly, I hope that information is helpful for you tonight and thank you for calling in. Let's go now to Brampton. Calling in on line five is Nicole. Hi there, Nicole. Thank you for your patience tonight. We've got lots of phone calls. It's your turn. Go ahead. Um, yes, I was just um, inquiring um, about the, the two gentlemen that are sitting there with you. Are they um, addicts and alcoholics themselves? Gentlemen, I will let you answer that question. Yeah, so I'm in recovery myself. I've experienced my own trauma as well. So I, I've, I've fought through my own problems. And it's, it's something that, that got me into this profession, uh, my own history. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that I was able to get out of my own situations. And, and now I can look at it and talk to other people and, and somewhat relate to what they have going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that creates an opportunity to, to, to connect with somebody when you've actually experienced some of the things that they've gone through as well. So I, I'm in my own recovery as well. Um, yeah, for myself, um, my past is my biggest asset. Um, I've been in recovery since I've been, like, my first time in treatment, I was 15 years old, so, and I'm almost 40 now, so I've been, through the cycle, I've gone through my relapses and um, I've turned my life around in the last five years. So I'm pretty proud of my past being able to overcome it and what I've learned from it. And I use and then that. And to take that and help others, to right? To help others, exactly. Yeah. 
I've always respected boundaries on this show, and I've always, I've always talked to my guests beforehand of whether or not they want to talk about their backgrounds. Nicole, uh, we appreciate your question. I, I'm sure that you, uh, it was coming from the right place, and I'm sure I'm, that you're glad to, to know that uh, these gentlemen are they're here to help. They have uh, been in the shoes of someone that has, has gone through some life trials, and now they're here to give back. So, Nicole, thanks so much for calling in tonight. Let's go now to line one. Maureen's phoning in from Toronto. Hi, Maureen. Yeah. You're live on our show. Go ahead. These gentlemen are... They're here to help. They have a... Maureen, you've got your television on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll go. Maureen, are you there, dear? Yeah. Okay, Maureen, we're, we're going to come back to you. So once again, folks, you can't have your television set on if, uh, if we're going to talk to you because of the delay. Um, so anyway, uh, do you think maybe we could try Maureen again, Jeff? Let's go now to line two. Maureen, have you turned your television down? Maureen, have we got you, dear? Well, Maureen called in for a reason, so we are going to try to get her. Um, so, gentlemen, we'll just, we'll just hang on and wait. Uh, let's go now to line two. Let's try Desmond calling in tonight from Kitchener. Desmond, are you there? Hello there. Desmond, are you on, you're live on our show right now. Are you there? Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, go ahead. Have you got a question a for us tonight? She's quite young. She's uh, 29. Right now we have her in a detox in Kitchener, and uh, well, she just actually uh, ended up in jail, and I'm trying to work with her probation officer to see if there's anything we can do to keep her out of here, to get her into a treatment program, because there doesn't seem to be anything. She keeps going on this uh, resolve, revolving door, you know, you go to jail, end up back on the street, and she gets nowhere fast, you know, and... We're concerned that, you know, pretty much, pretty soon she's going to die. We've had other people that we know that's died from crystal meth, and that's what she's on. And I don't think she has long to go if she doesn't get some help uh, and fast. Uh, Desmond, I, I missed the one part. How was she related to you? Is it, is it your daughter, granddaughter? No, she's a friend of mine. I, I a friend of yours. Okay, she'll do. Many years ago, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I still see her quite a lot. And uh, she's a really sweet person, and, you know, she needs, she, she needs help, and I'd like to help her. I, see, I work with a church, uh, a couple of churches in town here. I yeah. think, uh, worship music for them. And, you know, the songs that I'm singing about, I just want to you know, try and make her feel that, you know, that someone, that, that Jesus loves her and that, you know, there is help for her. Mm -hmm. um, gentlemen, she's on crystal meth, and someone's reaching out. They want to help her. How best can Desmond do that? Well, I mean, it sounds like you're trying to do some stuff a a as it is and trying to get her connected through the church or connected to some, some different ways of thinking, at least. Um, and that's, that's appropriate. I think I heard you say that she was in a detox right now. Um, I, I guess the key with, with a person like that is to not believe that just the detox is going to be the cure. The detox is, is just to get the body into a position where any form of treatment can start having an impact. Sure. So that initial detox is, is great. They've got to go through that process. But it's the next 14, 30, 60, 90 days of whatever is going to be going on in, in terms of treatment that's going to be critical. And it sounds like this person has, is a really a chronic relapser. And so a longer term, longer stay inpatient program is probably going to be the best. I heard something about jail in there as well not to really understand the legal aspects of it, but in, in terms of the addiction, a longer stay with a commitment from this person is probably the first starting point after detox. Mm -hmm. Frank, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, is it Desmond? Desmond. Desmond, mm -hmm. uh, you kept saying the revolving door of uh, detox and jail, and as uh, Daniel was saying, detox is just the start. Um, we need to um, figure out it's the question isn't um, you know what to do what you could do it's what she wants to do with herself if she sees a change and um, you can't really you know force somebody by twisting their arm but um, there are many options available if she's willing to get the help okay all right thank you gentlemen we're going to take another break here on living clean living well but when we come back more of your questions and comments our guests tonight daniel khan and frank mazawi from freedom from addiction It's scary to think that you're going to live the rest of your life without drugs and alcohol when it's all you've depended on. But there is hope. I knew I couldn't do it alone. And 
treatment allowed me the chance to ask for the help that I needed in order to believe that I could live a sober life. I got the help and support that I needed and even now that I've left, I still have that support there. Hello, I'm Ellen Campbell, the CEO and founder of the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness. As a charity, we depend on viewers such as yourself to support the programs for First Nations, women and children, anti-bullying and elder abuse. I invite you to visit our website, see what you can do to share. Any donation over $20 will receive a tax receipt. Thank you so much for all your support. Statistics state that it is likely you know a victim of abuse. It could be a friend, a relative, a colleague. It could even be you. One in three girls and one in five boys will be sexually abused before they reach the age of 18. Please give them hope. Help us make it stop. Go to abusehurts.com and give to the Canadian Centre for Abuse Awareness. Welcome back. Our phone lines have been lighting up tonight, and that's a good thing. I'm glad that we're here for you all. Let's go back. Our, our guests tonight, Daniel Kahn and Frank Mazawi. Let's head back to the phone lines. Line one, and Maureen is calling in from Toronto. Hi, Maureen. Can you hear us okay now? Yeah, we're good. Terrific. Have you got a question or a comment? Well, actually, I have quite a few things to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I, I actually went into the program mm -hmm. um, for almost seven and a half months. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I did really, really well for, like, the first initial six months. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, I, then I also went to, I might also say different um, places that I went to. Um, like, no, if care. that's important, it's just, just tell us am how I, you... Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> uh, uh, that you're asking me if it's okay to talk, talk about where you went? Well, I can say where I went, and am I allowed to say that? Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Did you have a question or a comment? Well, I do. So Go ahead. I went to Narcanon for seven and a half months. Yeah. And then my aftercare was with Cam H and also my GP, right? Mm hmm But I found when I went to, to Cam H, they had all it was was um, group sessions, it, and I really think I needed one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Uh, the group sessions... Um, gave me triggers, mm -hmm. and I found that that was really, really hard. Like, it was all the way downtown, and I would walk all the way home, which was, like, we're talking about 20 miles, right? Just get it out of my head. Yeah. Um, so I'm just giving you some information that maybe other people have actually experienced, okay. right? Sure. Or... You know, I think that I'm the kind of person that where um, when it comes to talking to people, I don't need a group session. I need one-on-one, -on -one, right? Are you getting that now? With my doctor, and actually I'm going, uh, I have an appointment on the 24th, so, mm -hmm. with a specialist, so, which is actually amazing, because I, I did this all on my own, with my own volition. Uh, which I'm kind you know, Maureen, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, we've had uh, some some calls in tonight from concerned parents, concerned grandparents about people, their loved ones are going through addiction and they don't know how to reach them. From someone that's been there, who reached you, Maureen? You said you did it all on your own. What was the turning point for you and what can you say to those those concerned parents that have called in tonight about their children? Right, no, I'm the one that started for me to go to a rehab. Mm -hmm. And then I had my, oh, I can't hear you, honey. I wasn't saying anything, go ahead. Um, I'm the one that started, I, I, I spoke to my father, and so he got me, he helped me to go to rehab. Mm -hmm. And, but like I said, it was by my own volition, because I'm the one that started it, right? Yeah. Um, but I, obviously I needed help. I had my whole family behind me and um, I, I still need help today, mm -hmm. right? And as opposed to um, what you were talking about, trauma in your life, yes, 
car accident you brought that up yes you know I, I locked a child one of the worst things you, that can happen to a person right mm-hmm. and um that's probably the feed of my my whole um um you know post-traumatic stress right right so um I know there is help out there, and I believe that there's help out there. Mm-hmm. And um, if you guys can give me any other angles that I can that I can you know reach, I would very much appreciate it. I know I'm doing what I can, but you know I want people to know there really is help out there. Mm-hmm. Daniel, do you want to uh, talk? Uh, to f- you? Firstly, congratulations. It sounds like you're you're doing well. And you, you, you've got one of the most important parts of recovery, which is self-awareness. You, you have a good awareness of what it is that you, what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And you're taking the steps to make sure that the things that are working for you, one-on-one sessions is what you've described, um, are going to continue to support your own recovery journey. And that's fantastic. Um, in terms of working with, with a counselor or finding the right therapist, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult to find somebody that you're comfortable with who has the expertise that you're looking for mm-hmm. and really has the connection that can open up some of these, the, these traumas that you've experienced. So I encourage you to keep searching for that one-on-one type of support that you're looking for that you've already experienced that has worked. And, and you know, there are different modalities for everyone. Some people really need a group environment and some people need a one-on-one environment. So it, it's great, Maureen, that you know what works for you. And now it's really up to you to really find that through the supports that you have in place. Mm-hmm. Frank, did you want to comment? Um, I agree with everything Daniel said, but uh, I'd also say you got the second most important thing, which is uh, family support. Right. Um, you cool. asked for help, you reached out for help, and you had it there, and they're behind you, which um, is very key for a lot of um, people struggling with addiction. If they reach out for help, it's really, really helpful to have family to support them in their desire to get better and not put them down for their actions. Thanks for calling in tonight, Maureen. Let's go down to line five. Mary's calling us from Etobicoke. Mary, you're live on our show and you're talking to Daniel and Frank tonight. Go ahead. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Frank. It's really nice to talk to you guys. It looks like you've been through it and it's uh, sometimes it sounds like we're almost so self-centered, all of us addicts, eh? Talking about us, me, me. (laughs) But my question is, um, being sober from alcohol, for um, close to 20 years. Uh, Unfortunately, the prescription pharmaceutical world where you go in because of a real problem of pain or cancer in my case, and doctors will freely write out a prescription for painkillers or sleeping pills. Then you get caught in the trap where you didn't go in and say, I want to get high. But now I'm trying to overcome the uh, narcotics and I'm having a hard time with that. I'm having a really hard time with it. And um, I don't know if there's as many places you can go to or your feedback on the difference between recovering from alcohol with almost a breeze compared to the world of drugs, which is a slow, creepy disease. Mm -hmm. People don't realize uh, you're, you know, getting there higher and higher until you fall apart yourself. And uh, if I can get your feedback on, I, I just have this theory that an awful lot of addicts are tortured souls, mm-hmm. whether it be something that people might think it's inherited, or is it just in their character and their nature? They're good, good people, but a little tortured. <laughs> I think that uh, you guys might be able to relate and help me on that. Is it a difference that, or are you aware of a difference between alcohol and drugs in recovery? Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Mary. Frank, go ahead. I, well, when it comes to uh, alcohol or drugs, the way I treat I treat them both equally because alcohol, in my mind, is a drug. Therefore, I look at them both respectively with the same vengeance. I tend to give my clients um, the weapons to fight the evil beast of addiction. And, um, you know, a lot of counselors will say we give you tools. I decide to give them weapons because it is a beast and you need to fight it. And whatever, you know, you may say that alcohol was an easier beast to beat and these prescription uh, medications or whatever, any drug seems a little harder. That's, that's your interpretation of it. That's the way you perceive it. And that's, that's fine. But if you still need help with it, there are places. We do do that at Freedom. We do help people with prescription medication um, addictions. 
and um, there, is a, there is a solution. You just need to reach out and get it. What are some of the weapons that you can deal with in prescription drug well, um, addiction? What would be a weapon? A weapon. I'm, is, I'm liking this this uh, this terminology. You know, <laughs> a weapon is like a little bit of self um, awareness. Okay. Um, a little bit of self love. Mm -hmm. um, having some confidence. It's all about self and have empowering yourself. A little bit of um, self power. Yeah. And um, it's like being on top of it. It's like looking at it with vengeance and hating the drug itself and. Um, conquering it and like if Superman were to fight let's say um, little Bull Peep he would not be considered much of a superhero now would he therefore he is fighting these super villains and when he beats them he even gets taken down sometimes and but he ends up coming back and winning and when he beats these super villains everybody hails him as such a superhero you've overcome alcohol you've got a little superhero inside of you so take that strength and let's Use that strength to overcome the next addiction. Daniel, do you want to follow up? Yeah, I, I think what you're saying at the end is bang on. Mar Mary, you've got this years and years, decades of experience in recovery from alcohol. And maybe just looking at, at your current situation with the narcotics differently might change a lot for you. Hmm. So in looking at it from a standpoint of this is just another addiction, just like alcohol was. I've beaten it once. I can do this again. And just changing the way you look at it might just be uh, the starting point for you to kind of get some confidence around it. Wonderful. Mary, I sure hope that that's helpful. And thank you very much for reaching out to us tonight. Um, in our last break, Frank just uh, he stopped for a minute and he said, we're getting a lot of phone calls about relapse. And I, uh, we have a couple of minutes left here before we wrap up our show tonight. Frank, what is it that you want to say to people about what we've heard from uh, people that are in addiction and also those loved ones that, that are caring about someone that's in addiction and relapse. Okay, well, when it comes to relapse, um, a lot of people think failure. Oh, they failed yeah. or, um, oh my God, what do we do now? I like to tell every one of my clients that, uh, first of all, tell yourself there's no such thing as failure. Yeah. There's only outcomes. And from those outcomes, we need to see there's either like a positive outcome, whatever the outcome is, but you could learn from every, from every negative outcome. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is no failure. So let's not look at the relapse as a failure or a loss of something. Yeah, you went one year, you went six months or whatever, but you did go six months. So let's see what you did, how you got those six months and what you learned from it. Mm -hmm. Daniel, what are your thoughts? I, I think one of the key things is to separate the addiction from the person. Yeah. If we can just separate those two things and look at the addiction as sometimes winning and sometimes losing. So looking at the, the, the two things separately will support connection to the individual without the addiction and looking at the addiction as the thing that we're actually fighting and, and, and being able to not feel like we're doing something negative against the person, but we're really fighting against that particular behavior or that action that this individual is unfortunately addicted to. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can start separating those two things and, and really understanding that relapse may occur, but it's really what happens during that relapse. Is the person being honest? Is the person communicating and looking for more help? Yeah. Or are they hiding it? And it, looking at it separately that way can really give you, a, a, as a person on the outside, provide a different type of support to that individual, whether it needs to be a soft, caring approach or a little bit more of a hard-nosed approach in terms of what has to happen next. And Frank, I've got about 30 seconds. What would you say to someone that is in recovery and, go and relapses? What's the best self-care that they need to do? What I would say is get back on the horse, get back to what you were doing that was working. Let's not look at what, well, let's pay attention to what caused you to fall, mm -hmm. but let's get back and see what kept you up there for those three months or whatever it was. Use the positive things that yeah. have been working for you. And keep the shame and the guilt away? Um, yeah, I, I would yeah. keep the shame and the guilt away. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All righty, we're going to uh, wrap up uh, right after this short break here on Living Clean, Living Well. You're watching it live tonight on CTS. I've been through multiple treatment centers uh, with my addiction, fighting it for the last 10 years, 17 detoxes, three different treatment centers. 
but uh, they put me into counseling and everything here after my detox, which is the smartest thing I could have ever done. I got the real demons out of me that I wasn't able to do over the last 10 years with all those other detoxes, all those other treatment centers, from private ones to government ones. And this place is actually giving me my life back. Our guest tonight, Daniel Kahn of Frank.